when we read about, when we read the newspapers, when we watch the news. Environmental, like, the environment is a huge concern. And we know that the government is making environmental policies, they're, they're stressing on envi environmental policies in terms of, you know, cars, reducing carbon emissions, and a lot of, like, petroleum companies are forced to innovate in terms of, yeah, you know, additives in order to get more miles. And, and it all comes down to one thing. It all comes down to leaving a better planet for our future generations. It all comes down to sustainability. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabiola Neto, and I'm from the University of Nottingham Malaysia campus. We are TNF Consulting, and before we begin today, I will introduce to you my team members. This is Lisa, Charles, and this is Ben. Today, we're going to talk to you about the electric vehicle batteries market. And I will go on further, but before that, I will give you the agenda for today. The agenda is going to help you understand the flow of our presentation. And as you can see at the bottom, we've actually made that for you, for you to follow the flow of the presentation. First, I will begin by talking to you about the context, about the electric vehicle battery market, and will explain to you what the business life cycle and the global market and the objective of our presentation today. Then, we will proceed to the issue analysis in terms of my, macro, micro, and, and we will move on to the strategy. After we're done with our strategy, we will move on to impact, and this will all be done by my three other colleagues. All right, moving on. What do we know about the case? In order to help you understand our strategy, we are giving you context that are extracted from the case and analyzed by us um, that we feel is important. And before I proceed to my context, um, we are under the assumption that we are pitching to you uh, as in the electric vehicle batteries incumbents, which are the three key, uh, which are key players of the electric vehicle batteries uh, market, which is like companies like Samsung, Panasonic, and um, AESC. Yes, and we are management consultants consulting for the incumbents in the industry. So before I talk about the electric vehicle battery market, I'll talk to you about the global car market. So in the global car market, there is an estimated of 81.7 million cars. And out of these 81.7 million cars, only 3% of the cars are electric vehicles. That's 2.45 million. And why are there bad responses for electric vehicles? Because it's expensive, that's one. And two, it's not as fast. And in terms of the range, we all know that there's limited ranges for electric vehicles. And there is lack of infrastructure in a sense of like, I'm too scared to travel long distance because um, I might not be able to find a charger, you know? And I think all of us face that problem with our iPhones, you know? And moving on to our business life cycle for lithium ion batteries, which is the batteries used in electric cars, we know that it is currently at the growth stage and there's potential. And now we'll move on to the electric vehicle battery market. The batteries, um, the market is currently facing a price decline, and there is a problem of product performance fluctuation, and they are also currently facing risk. Why are they facing risk? Because when, when car manufacturers order for batteries from you, they might say, hey, I would like 500 batteries. But then if the market demand is low, they might come back tomorrow and only take 250, and you have no choice. So our objective today is how can electric vehicle battery manufacturers successfully respond to market uncertainties and actually remain sustainable in the long run. I will now talk about the issue analysis, and the first one is the macro analysis. Before we go in depth, we will talk about pastel. What is pastel? Pastel is political, economical, social, technological, environmental, and legal. Due to time constraints, I'm only going to talk to you about the main ones. In terms of political, we know that m most countries have green policies in terms of sustainability. And we also know that there's an instability of all, of all producing countries, like the Middle East. And coming from Malaysia, you know, we have Petronas, and we, um, yeah, so we, 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 we produce oil as well, and we know how like, unstable the oil prices can be. And in terms of, um, Economic, we know that the cost of fuel is increasing, and um, a lot of a lot of nations depend on imported oil. And in terms of legal, we know that there is a lot of regulations for the automotive industry, in terms of making sure that cars that are produced are not 
um, polluting the environment so much. So as you can see, in the United States, we've graphically um, we visualized it for you. This is the US standards for carbon dioxide emissions. And in the year 2010, it was 240. And by the year 2020, they expect to reduce it to 152. I will now pass it on to Charles to talk about the next issue analysis. Thank you very much, Fabiola. Next, I will share with you our initial analysis using the Porter's Five Forces analysis, which will identify the industry attractiveness. There are five of them, as you can see, and what we will find out here is, as you can see from the red bars, it actually shows how high is the threat. If the industry competition, we rate it as two bars because we believe that at the moment there are four main players, and there are not many new entrants coming in. The new, the threat that we've identified is Chinese manufacturers coming in to this market. Because Chinese manufacturers can affect the cost of the attractiveness of the industry. In the industry, what we understand is the R&D cost is very high. And sometimes these uh, companies are not able to enter. However, the threat is not that high because for battery of electrical vehicles, the product validation is actually two years. And they, I think some of the car car manufacturers would have a problem trusting Chinese manufacturers based on the reputation. In terms of bargaining power of buyer, they are heavily, like my colleague Fabiola has mentioned, they are heavily dependent on the car manufacturer's demand for their cars. So if there are less people demanding cars such as the Nissan Leaf, therefore battery, battery demand will be less as well. In terms of the bargaining power of suppliers, uh, raw materials, uh, they have bargaining power because they demand a lot of things. So raw materials are not so much of a problem. Next. Next, I will share with you the value chain analysis that we've identified. In the whole value chain, how we can, what we will do is we'll actually mention only three things. First, on the infrastructure. The second is on the technology. And the third is on the operation. What we want to find out here is how we can improve the value chain of these battery, man, battery manufacturers. In terms of the operation, the quality is very important. Therefore, we will actually reduce battery costs. I will elaborate further in the next slide. In terms of technology, what we find is they need, uh, they need very good R&D in order to remain relevant in this market because there are only four main players. Any drop in the R&D would actually affect, uh, would actually cause them to not be as competitive. In terms of infrastructure, they have to increase their infrastructure costs. So I've actually consolidated the analysis into this into this graph so that it's easier to understand. So as Fabiola has mentioned, there's insufficient demand. Therefore, the cap capacity utilization of the plants of these uh, battery manufacturers are, are actually less than optimal. So for LG Chemical, it's only 60.2%. And for Samsung, it's 77%. So a lot of the battery factories are underutilized in this sense. Therefore, efficient economies of scale cannot be achieved. In terms of the technology in the value chain management, the R&D improvements, I've said, is very important to remain competitive. But one of the things that we identify in the value chain management and through analysis from Bloomberg is that through in the next, they predict in the next 15 years, by 2030, the cost the, re the battery cost will actually reduce a lot from 1,000 to the, the, as you can see from the indication, to roughly around 200 to 300. In terms of the battery pack production, but these costs will only reduce if the battery pack production reaches 160 in terms of the, the weight of the GWH. So after doing all the analysis, what we want to do is we want to give you a few strategies. We've actually identified up to seven different strategies. But what we understand is strategies is a choice. It's a trade-off. And to achieve something, you have to lose something. And we've identified these seven strategies. But after discussing with the group, we believe that our three strategies are the best strategies uh, to go for. So as you can see here, uh, the strategies that we want to go for is something with high value as well as uh, easy execution. Therefore, you can see from the matrix. So the three strategies that we've gone for is to invest in value creation, to uh, go into market penetration, as well as diversification. Therefore, I will invite my next colleague, Li Xiang, to elaborate further. 
It is one wise man said, successful people they create the opportunity rather than compare to normal people that they wait for opportunity and they grab the opportunity. So this is exactly what we're trying to propose to our clients that you need to create opportunity by adding value to the value chain. So the first action that we like to do in investing in the value creation is to do strategic alliance, be it to partner with government or to partner with different R&D facilities. So how do you do that? We can partner with government and then we could develop what we call the green economy policy together with them. And then by, for instance, uh, the policy can be encouraging more citizens to buy electric vehicles and they'll get they will enjoy you know, tax exemption, they'll get cheaper rates for parking, they'll get cheaper cheaper rate for toll. And we can also partner with partner with R and D facility. Together we invest in R and D and we can actually share the risk across our partners. So moving on to the action two in investing in value creation is by doing CSR activities. So why do you want to do CSR activities? The reason is that we want to create more awareness campaign and then we want to educate our citizens and public about the importance of clean energy. So moving on to the third action is actually what we call the TQM, Total Quality Management. So the concept of TQM is actually continuous improvement in terms of improve the efficiency of our battery pack and second, of course, to improve the quality of our battery pack and then to gain more confidence from our partners from our uh, clients as well as public. So in terms of the impact that can bring that can bring by investing in value creation is that ultimately we can improve demand in electric vehicles and also to improve social perceptions as well as awareness on the importance of clean energy. However, in terms of risk, every every strategy they have their own risk. So the risk in this strategy is actually the failure in strategy alliance. According to statistics, every strategy alliance, 60% of them, they, they fail because of you know, miscommunication, because of clashes of culture management, and so on and so forth. Okay, the next strategy that I would like to propose is diversification. According to the ESOP, ESOP matrix, this, um, this strategy is located at the third quadrant, so the product that we're trying to propose is actually house battery and target market is actually the household. Condominium, terrace, and so on and so forth. So let me, answer, let me emphasize this. This is actually a long-term strategy and it's rather a brave, bold, radical strategy. Why? Because we are trying to <coughs> propose our client to invest in the production of household battery pack that ultimately to, to encourage every household in the world to use clean energy. So what's the risk? The risk is the failure of implementing this strategy, of course. And the second risk is the lack of support from the government. And the impact is that you will reduce depending the depends on uh, the, the depends on uh, uh, our clients on more, too much on EV market. Instead, they can diversify their risk in domestic market as well. So moving on to the next strategy, my colleague Varan will tell us more on how do you maximize your potential through market penetration. As what my colleague Lisa has proposed, <clears throat> the radical strategy is much of a long-term strategy and it can only be implemented if the, the other two strategies is successfully implemented. So now I'm here to talk about the third strategy which is the market penetration in terms of product and market. So by looking at the NSOF matrix, we realize that the incumbent of the industry actually have the products of BEV, HEV, and H, uh, PHEV, which is the three types of bad, uh, EV vehicles. And three types of EV vehicles, they have different types of uh, different types of batteries in order to make them work. So in terms of market, we are already in the automotive market, which is we call the EV market. So by looking at the NSOF metrics, we realize that we can actually relax the HEV, which is uh, the cars like both Toyota Prius, Prius C and so on, and we focus in PHEV and BEV. PHEV is already implemented, is already produced, producing by GM, General Motors, in Chevrolet. So why do I say that? Why do I say that we should relax HEV and focus in PHEV plus BEV? Because based on the statistics and the forecast of JP Morgan and or the research firm, we realize that HEV versus BHEV plus BEV, in terms of units, 
in, uh, which is market share, in 2013, HEV got 90%. But look at 2020, they only have 70%, and we can see the growth in market share by PHEV plus BEV. And in terms of growth, we have already calculated the growth based on the statistics, and we can see that from 2013 to 2020, PHEV and BEV will have a accumulated growth of 2,200%, and consisting of PHEV, uh, to have 2,000% and BEV have 200%. Both of them is actually having a higher growth as compared with P uh, HEV. So in terms of revenue of BEV and PHEV in total, 2013 is only 18%, but look at what happened in 2020. It will increase to 38%. That's why we propose a strategy of penetrating into this product. And in terms of market, which is the EV, EV makers, the automakers, so based on the research report again by JP Morgan, B3, SDI and IIT, they forecasted a growth of near to 150% from 2013 to 2020 in the EV market alone. So who should we go into? There are so many companies in the auto market industry and who are the people that we want to, uh, that we want to penetrate into? They would be Toyota because they are the market leaders. In terms of HEV, they produce near to 300,000 units a year and in terms of PHEV, which I mentioned just now, GM, General Motors, they have near to 25,000 units uh, which is produced in uh, 2013, but look at the annual growth. It will grow up to 150% in 2020. In the long run, we realize that there's actually another untapped, there's actually another potential market that we can go into, which is the Europe region. Because by 2020, in the long run, Europe region will constitutes 26% of the whole global market and the impact will be increase in market share as well as we can prevent the entry of Chinese competitors which is the Chinese manufacturers who come in with low prices but uncertain quality and what are the risks there's of because our report is all based on the research firm so there will be a risk of false information also there will be a risk of going into European market, European region market in the long term. And lastly, there will be a risk of failure in agreement because we are dealing with a lot of companies, for example, like automakers, etc. And in terms of implementation timeline, we have three strategies. So by looking at the first strategy, which is investing in value creation, TQA can be done in the short term and it is an ongoing process. And CSR can be done in the medium term. Strategic alliances come after that. And diversification, as we have said earlier, it is an optional strategy, but a very radical one. So it will be done in year three, second half, provided that the other strategies is successful. And the last one, market penetration, uh, going into more automakers and Europe will be in the short term and ongoing, and focus in PHEV plus BEV will be in the medium term. In terms of impact that we have, we can have by implementing our strategies, we have came up with three scenarios, which is the worst case, base case, and base best case scenario. So we can see that no matter which scenario it is, our strategy, implementing our strategy will have revenue growth for sure and also the increased percentage of EV cost of total vehicles. So after looking at all this, we can see that implementing our strategy would actually give a very high impact to the incumbent of the industry and it will, it will help to prevent, prevent the Chinese, Chinese manufacturers from coming into the market and getting their market share. So with this, we would like to wrap up our presentation. Thank you. I guess that's, that's it. Uh, well, uh, we'll open the floor to our judges. Uh, you have 15 minutes uh, to ask uh, any questions that have come up. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I think it was pretty good. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Thanks. That was really good. Thanks. Um, <laughs> it's hard, hard act to follow. Uh, so you clearly understand. Demonstrate you understand a lot. I've got a few questions. So you mentioned just from the last presentation, there, the the last present. Uh, you mentioned. EU was a, you mentioned some risks uh, about an alliance, if the, the strategy doesn't work, or government support. 
have we thought about how you could tackle these sources? So the most important element in managing good strategic alliance relationships is actually based on trust as well as communications. So what we can do during strategic alliance is that those companies, they, they should come together and those directors and leaders, they should sit down together and then they have to really identify the identical goals of both companies. So for instance, if both companies, they both share different kind of cultures, different kind of practice, in the end of the day, there will be definitely dispute, there will be definitely a lot of you know, disagreement between these two companies and eventually leads to failure of strategic alliance. Okay. Uh, may I add on? So in terms of going into the EU region, we realised that actually there is an EU cri uh, Euro, Euro bond crisis which actually disrupted that region. So it is in the recovery stage now. So if in the long term we are going into the market, perhaps we can take more uh, what we call a hedging strategy so that we can hedge the risk of interest rate going too high in the short term or in the long term. Thank you. Um, I noticed that the current, you know, I mean, there, you mentioned it yourself that actually the, electron, the electric vehicles are actually such a small percentage right now of all automobiles. Um, and uh, yes, you talked about what the future would be like when you the picture of how it has to be sustainable. But, but very light and almost maybe next to nothing on, on the current, you know, the current larger piece there, which is the, you know, the traditional auto, automakers. Um, did this factor at all into into your analysis? And and how do you see that that play off in terms of what we have to be considering? Um, basically, this case was talking about from the perspective of a battery manufacturer. So we actually looked at it in terms of the car manufacturer and how we can actually provide the demand uh, to these car manufacturers. But what we find is the car manufacturers are unable to uh, meet their demand as well. So therefore, our demand is unable to reach uh, what, what, what we, we wanted to get. So the, the utilization rate is much lesser. So. What I also add, right now, traditional car manufacturers are heavily reliant towards natural resources that we know is going to eventually finish <laughs> within the next few years. So we know that in order for sustainability-wise, companies need to continually innovate, and we know that at one point of time, they're going to have to consider the option of creating electric vehicles in order for them to sustain, because if there's no oil, what's the point of creating cars? Who's going to want to buy cars when petrol prices are going to increase due to the um, lack of supply? And we know that eventually, in the long run, cars are going to, I mean, uh, traditional manufacturers are going to want to produce electric vehicles. That's why we felt that in our business life cycle, we are still in the growth stage because the demand is going is bound to increase. It's only a matter of time. I hope that answers your question. So you mentioned about in your sort of um, context, you, you rightly point out that price is a concern quite high at this present moment. So what is your strategy in terms of pricing? Because you actually have your last slides on the worst space and the, 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 the best uh, scenario. About that sort of uh, revenue impact, I wonder, can you elaborate a little bit more about what are you going to use on the pricing strategy in different stages? Sorry, can you just give us a few seconds? Sure, yeah, please. By analyzing on the case studies as a research that shows us that shows that in future the price of making a battery pack will, will decrease from one thousand dollar per, per battery pack to only twenty dollar per battery pack. And due to technology advancement, I believe that in, in near future, one or two years time, econ economy of scales is going to be like, achievable very easily. That's one. Secondly, so how do we add more value in value chain? How do we reduce costs in value chain? Is by increasing more demand in, 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 in battery pack. Because from the case that we have studied, we realized that the plant, the capacity of the plant is actually underutilized. 
and that is why it increases the cost of you know manufacturing the battery the second and the third point is that what we can do is to invest more on R&D technology we, we understand that investing in R&D technology could be very high in the initial stage but in the long run by investing in R&D te uh, technology in the battery pack we can definitely increase the efficiency of the battery itself and which in turn reduce the cost of producing a battery. <coughs> yeah, I, I like the way you guys have taken this thing and, and actually trying to add value in the, in the battery. So you, you basically done a really good sales job. <laughs> You're trying to convince a long term strategy. So it's interesting enough, so you mentioned you have to invest a lot early and that that in itself costs a lot of money and it's big it's big risk. Yeah. Right? And it is every chance you, you mentioned the very risk various risks. Um, so if I was an investor, right, why should I give money to you in a market that's not performing and I'm not probably not gonna see any money until two thousand twenty as as you as you mentioned. By demonstrating to the investors, uh, what, what we would like to show to the investors is that we are not we are we are we have a vision, and we have the market in, in, in the company in the company because we are all incumbent uh, we are all the industry leaders as we are proposed proposing to, so we are going into different type of markets and we can see a potential in there as what Tesla Motors is doing now, they are they are they are similar to this this incumbent leaders they are also producing batteries and. They are going very far by, by by having the vision at the very beginning, saying that oh, I wanna I wanna produce I wanna manufacture batteries for household, so that now no longer we now households no longer use electricity. So this is what we are actually demonstrating to the investors by saying that hey, we can also do the same thing. We are also going into the household market, and at the same time we are going into the EV market, which is growing, as as forecasted by all the investment bankers and research firm, and yes. Uh, by, by showing the potential and the strong financial position that all the incumbent leader, uh, all the industry leaders having right now, we can surely successfully persuade the leaders, uh, persuade the investors to invest in this project and to get to gain a very uh, high return in the long term. Earlier, when you were this, uh, you know, in the analysis portion, and you said one of the key things to focus on would be um, trying to convince the government to support and things like that. I think, um, of course, that that makes a lot of sense. But could, but probably easier than said than done, right? Did you did you have other, for lack of time, maybe unable to present? But did you have other thoughts on how this could come about? Um. Actually, this idea it was inspired by one of the real cases, one of the real cases in Malaysia. Because in Malaysia, back in 2012 and 2013, our Malaysia government actually imposed a new tax regulations in terms of e uh, electric vehicles. So, in the tax regulation, it, uh, our government actually reduced uh, uh, on top of 10,000 ringgit subsidy. It also uh, eliminate the whole tax and uh, uh, tax imposing in in the EV. E vehicles and in terms, the e vehicles in Malaysia reduced significantly and increased really increase the, um, the demand of e vehicles significantly. So the government put a tax no. and then they gave money back. They take away the tax. Or they took away the tax. Yes. 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 Yes.
procedure, all the vehicles which is imported uh, from other countries, they'll be charged like 200, 300% tax. Oh, yeah. So for this, this kind of mini vehicles which is which we import from other countries, they are not they are not charged by the tax of 300%. They are yeah, charged just, about 100 and 200%. Uh, okay. So per se, I mean, this is Malaysian government, and now you're in Hong Kong, I don't think we have that policy in place. And we have been in quite a strong debate about that sort of um, environmental sort of protest, pro 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 Protestants about this issue. Mm -hmm. So, in what if you, I am uh, Mr. Lam, um, the, the chief executive of Hong Kong SAR, how are you convincing me that we should be doing this for Hong Kong? When I, hi, I'm, I'm going to yeah. take my question. Yeah, sure. um, we know that, okay, I, you probably know this better since you live in Hong Kong, yeah. but uh, coming from someone who's just re visited Hong Kong, yeah. like just came in, I, I, we read a lot of news about how in China pollution, air pollution is a really, really bad problem. And if we can convince the government, we, we can convince the investor that what you're investing in is actually adding value to the environment and you're adding value to the people as well because you're actually helping to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions and you're helping to reduce pollution. And we all know that the air quality here is not the best in the world. And if you could do something in order to help that, why wouldn't you? And adding on to that, based on the case itself, US, Europe, and most of the developed, uh, developing and developed countries in, in Asia, they are actually having their standards for CO2 emission uh, stated from 2013 to 2020. So they already have the objective of reducing their CO2 emission by the year of 2020. And what we are proposing to the government would actually help them uh, as part of as part of the uh, strategy to make this happen by reducing the CO2 emission from a very high level to a to a really optimum level, which government is actually looking for. Okay. I guess that's a wrap. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.